I believe this is the vehicle they were killed in as they tried to flee from the merciless attacks. She managed to get out of Gaza and to get to Cairo, but it was too late. Once she had the surgery, she passed away. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Maine to New York City and points west. On the program today, outrages in Syria, Mazen Kumsiya at the Palestine Museum U.S., a talk by Yusuf al-Jamal, a Palestinian from the Gaza Strip, and previews from next week's show, rallies in New York City against Hindu supremacy and against a plan to build more fracked gas power plants in Connecticut. What do these four children have in common? They're all from the same family. They were all killed this week, along with five other members of their family by Assadist or Russian bombs. I believe this is the vehicle they were killed in as they tried to flee from the merciless attack. This is Ahmed Jafal. He stubbornly refused to leave Marat Newman in Syria as Assad forces occupied the ruins of the city. Assadists shot him and one put his boot on him as a trophy in a photograph. We blacked out his corpse in the photo. We know about this because Assadists were proud of this killing and photo and posted it on social media. A demonstration in northern Indiana in favor of Syrians in Idlib. So what should we be saying about Syria? Here are some possible slogans. Turkey, Europe, US, give refuge to Syrian refugees. Airdrop and drone drop food and supplies to Syrians under siege. Pressure Assad and Putin to stop the bombing. Sanction those who take part in war crimes. Never forget. Now the conclusion of Dr. Mazen Kumsiya's Schaefer Lecture at the Palestine Museum U.S. Uh, the woman in the black hat in the middle, her name is Mati al -Mughannam. She wrote a book in 1936, and I'm sure Martin Luther King read it. Why? Because almost some of his words are exactly the words that she was using in that book. They told her, why don't you stick to women's rights? Why do you have to speak against the British and against the Zionists and against this and against that? She answered in exactly the same way. All great minds think alike. <laughs> but anyways, you know, it's hypocritical if we say this is a Palestinian struggle or this is a Vietnamese struggle or this is a Black Lives Matter struggle. Why? I'm not black. I, you know, what, what, uh, the first the first struggle I joined, by the way, was not the Palestinian struggle, believe it or not. I was at the University of Connecticut, a student, master student, young, 22, 23 year old. This, uh, I was elected president of the International Student Union at uh, the University of Connecticut. And this black guy comes to me and says, what are, Mazin, you're now the president, he's a friend of mine. I said, yeah. He said, what are you going to do about South Africa? <laughs> and I was like, so naive, I said, what's wrong with South Africa? <laughs> this is 1980, I'm talking about. <laughs> and of course, he educated me, and, uh, and we brought a speaker from London, actually, who later I found out is a member of the ANC, the African National Congress. And of course, the ANC was designated terrorist organization, and so of course, he couldn't publish publicized his connections to the ANC, and he had to be very, very careful in what he said when he was here. But he also educated us, and then when we asked him what do you want us to do, he said, well, you know, there's a thousand things you can do. You can do media work, or work on your congressman, lobby, you know, like Yusuf told you, there's God, call the congressman, whatever. Uh, and he said, you can engage in BDS, work at investment sanctions. <laughs> That's the first time, by the way, I heard the word BDS. Well, not in connection with Palestine, it was in connection with South Africa. So, 
why did we care about South Africa? What was it about South Africa that, you know, it was so far away? But it is this human struggle and this human decency and the, and the understanding, by the way, that all our struggles are connected. I was invited to speak in Mumbai, by the way. 500 people attended my lecture. Most of them, essentially 98% of them, were what's called the lower caste. You know, disenfranchised people who are really in, in, in Indian Hindu structures were discriminated against. And uh, so I was kind of, I knew the answer, but I wanted to confirm it. I said, you know, there's a million people on the streets in Mumbai living on the streets, you know, some of them naked or half naked, and they don't have anything. Why do you care about those? Why invite me to come and speak? As I said to the leader of this group that invited me, he said, well, do you know who Modai is? I said, yeah, of course I know who Modai is. He said, do you know who his best friend is? I said, yeah, Netanyahu. He said, that's the clique that we're fighting. That's the group we're fighting. And our struggles are connected. Uh, and it is true, you know, Netanyahu, uh, you know, Modai and Trump and all these people who are in power and are very rich, making the rich richer and the poor poorer. This is our enemy and we should join forces to fight these people, including, by the way, Abu Mazen, the president of the Palestinian Authority, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, okay, I should stop here and take some questions and I'm happy to answer them. This is a talk given by Palestinian writer and researcher Yusuf Al-Jamal. He spoke at the Greater Hartford Islamic Center last month. His stories about what happened to his family are wrenching. So my family ended up as refugees uh, in 1948 after our village, Aqr, which is uh, very close to Lod, uh, was ethnically cleansed. And uh, we ended up in Nusayrat refugee camp in the middle of the map of the Gaza Strip, if you see. And the Nusayrat is one of eight refugee camps in Gaza. Um, Nusayrat is not the most crowded refugee camp. Uh, compared to other refugee camps, it's considered spacious and good. And we have uh, considerably um, a good infrastructure compared to Jabalia refugee camp. So in Nusayrat, we have almost 100,000 refugees. Uh, in Jabalia, up in the north, there are more than 100,000 refugees who live in one square kilometer. Nusayrat is nine square kilometer. Um, so we used to, my family used to live in uh, Aqr, which is, uh, you know, the spot you see in the map. Today it's called Kiryat Ikron. It was ethnically cleansed and my great-grandfather was killed in the village by Zionist uh, militias who ended the uh, uh, who invaded the uh, village and uh, kicked Palestinians out. So half of the family ended up in the, the Gaza Strip, the other half ended up in the West Bank. That's where my mother comes from, uh, from Beit Sahur, uh, Dr. Mazin's village. She grew up in Beit Sahur, and my father uh, ended up in Nusayrat refugee camp. Uh, to tell you more about the refugee camp, it's very crowded, there is uh, no space to, to play, so growing up in, in Gaza as a kid, a child, I had no play, uh, and no place to, to play, and uh, we used to play games that were, in many different ways, impacted by the Israeli occupation, for example, Israeli soldiers and Palestinians, and we would divide ourselves into two groups, and I used to uh, join the Israeli soldiers group because I used to enjoy um, beating my friends. Uh, so this is how you know the incubation uh, shapes our uh, life in many different ways. To talk about electricity, uh, so Gaza's only power plant is located in my refugee camp, and this is a, a photo that was taken in 2014 when Israel destroyed the power plant completely. Uh, this was not the first time Israel bombed the power plant. In 2006, they destroyed it again. So the only thing that we get from this power plant is trouble. We never get electricity. So we have up to 12 hours, sometimes 16 hours of uh, electricity outages per day. And this impacts uh, the lives of students, patients at hospitals, all walks of life, all segments of the society. Uh, 
uh, are impacted by these uh, electricity outages. Uh, and imagine if you are a student, just to give you an, exa an example, and you have an exam the next day. You, the way you study and when you study is, is shaped and uh, determined by these electricity uh, outages. And that's why many people uh, ended up buying generators to have electricity. And that's why I call this Gaza the city of one million generator. We have almost one million generators in Gaza. And imagine in a place like Gaza, which is very crowded, when electricity goes off and you have all these families who live in very crowded areas uh, turning their generators on. And you could imagine the uh, noise and uh, you know the pollution that we get, noise pollution uh, as well as environmental uh, pollution. Um, Again, Israel bombed the only sewage uh, desalination facility, which is located right next to the power plant. And this means that uh, thousands of uh, uh, you know, cubic uh, meters of sewage makes it to the Mediterranean every day. And this is a photo uh, of what we call the Gaza Valley. In fact, it's not a valley, it's a valley of sewage um, that ends up in the Mediterranean. And again, you know, oceans and seas are not racist, so usually the uh, waves and currents go to the north, and this is the Israeli-controlled uh, shores, and that's why they finally allowed the International Committee of the Red Cross to implement some projects to treat, uh, you know, the sewage. Not because they care about Palestinians, but they, they care about themselves. Uh, and again, this is a photo of um, a mosque that was completely destroyed near my family's house in 2014. Um, speaking of water, uh, one of the challenges that we face in, in Gaza is the lack of clean water. 97% uh, of Gaza's water is unfit for human consumption. And uh, I remember once that I made a mistake and I drank from this sweet water, as my father described it, and I ended up in the hospital. Uh, so that's why people buy water. Uh, and they only use this water to wash their hands or dishes or shower, etc. It's not healthy, but they do not have any other option. Um, again, speaking of the continuing devastation of the Gaza Strip, starting from 2006 and even before, but we had three major Israeli offensives in 2009, which claimed the lives of 1,500 Palestinians. In 2012, which claimed the lives of 200 Palestinians. And finally, in 2014, uh, where uh, 2,200 Palestinians were killed. The majority of them were uh, civilians, uh, children, and women. And again, Gaza has been under siege since 2006. Uh, this is how, for example, you know, kids play in the street. This is an small street in, in, in the refugee camp, usually it's one, two meters. And uh, children again use uh, gun toys to play because this is the only thing they get to see. Uh, this is a sports club that was completely destroyed in 2012. Um, and again, as a result of these catastrophic uh, conditions, uh, nearly 30,000 Palestinians left the Gaza Strip in 2018. Most of them were young people and they're trying to migrate uh, to Europe through Turkey. Uh, so these days there are tens, tens of thousands of Palestinians in Istanbul uh, waiting to, to make their way to uh, Greece. Ironically, in, in, uh, during the uh, Second World War, there were uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, Greek refugees who ended up in my refugee camp because of war. Uh, this is a photo of uh, desperate Palestinians trying to leave through the Rafah crossing. So now I will talk briefly about the Rafah crossing and crossings that connect Gaza with the outside world. And uh, in the second photo, we have a Palestinian smuggling his wife through a tunnel. So as a result of the siege, Palestinians dug 1,500 tunnels that connect Gaza, Rafah, with Egypt. And they smuggled all types of uh, cigarettes, cars, food, milk, wives, anything. Uh, and even animals, um, like lions and things like that. Uh, but again, these tunnels were shut down in 2013. And uh, again, we're back. The siege is very tight these days. Um, okay, now speaking of crossings, I will jump to this story here. So this is my mother with her family. 
My mother grew up in Beis Sahur and uh, she ended up in Gaza in 1978 when she got married. And it took her 12 years to get an Israeli permit to see her own family, which lives an hour and a half drive away from our refugee camp in, in Gaza. And only after you know I started writing about her case, I mean she's not uh, her case is not uh, uh, unique in the sense that there are thousands of Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank who have families in, in both territories and they are divided. Uh, but again, her story shows how Israel divides Palestinians. When we talk about division, that uh, this division is uh, geographic in many different uh, ways, then it's political. Uh, so it took her 12 years to get a permit. Her parents passed away in 2003, 2008, and she was not able to participate in the funeral procession. But again, she was lucky enough to, to, to get there, uh, finally. In 2015, Israel gave her another permit because her, her eldest brother passed away. So only in except, under very tight and exceptional, and it's random in many different ways where Palestinians get permits to, to get there. She got a permit last year, 2019, because she got breast cancer. And again, she was lucky enough to get medical coverage from the Palestinian Authority in, 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 in the West Bank, and then travel to Jerusalem because there are dozens of Palestinian patients especially cancer patients, I'm talking about dozens of cancer patients who p passed away because uh, they were not able to get permits from Israel. In some cases, Israel would give these patients uh, a permit to have the first uh, chemotherapy session, but not the second one. And they would ask them to collaborate against their people in order to get the second permit. Um, and speaking of uh, patients, in 2007, my sister, Zainab, was working as an UNRWA teacher and uh, she needed a minor surgery. So when she was younger, she had her gallbladder removed. And uh, she needed, uh, so doctors installed uh, a mesh instead, and she needed to replace this mesh. And again, Israel did not give her a permit. She waited one week at the hospital, and then she got a rejection. And the Rafah crossing that connects Gaza with Egypt was shut down by then, and she waited one more week, and she had a liver failure as a result. She managed to get out of Gaza and to get to Cairo, but it was too late. Once she had the surgery, she passed away. And again, to bring her body back to Gaza, the Rafah crossing was shut down. And there is another crossing, commercial crossing, that uh, Palestinians tried to get through back to Gaza called Kerim Shalom crossing. And the Israeli army would send her body back. So they brought her body to Al Arish Hospital, which is 50 miles away from Gaza. And uh, every time they try for two days to, to bring her body back to Gaza, the Israeli army will send them back uh, with her body in the ambulance. And finally, on the third day, she was allowed uh, into Gaza. Again, her case is not unique. There are hundreds, probably 700, 800 people, uh, cancer patients, uh, people who suffered kidney failure, etc., chronic diseases who passed away uh, at least during the first three years of Israel's siege on, on, on Gaza. Uh, this is a photo of my youngest brother, Omar. I have two brothers named Omar, and the reason I have two brothers named Omar is because in 2014, Israel killed my eldest brother named Omar in the refugee camp. And, uh, you know, Palestinians are demographic threat to Israel, and they want to have more babies, so uh, my parents had another baby, and they, as expected, they named him after my eldest brother named Omar. So I contributed a story called Omar X to a collection of short stories, Gaza Rights Back, that was published in the United States in 2014, called Omar X. It's about like Malcolm X. Uh, the fact that my youngest uh, brother was given a name probably he didn't want to, to get. And the complexity of you know, growing up having this name, the name of someone who was, uh, uh, you know, of a brother, eldest brother who was killed by, by Israel. And again, I have uh, the photo of uh, El youngest Omar because it's about life. You know, this is the message that we need to uh, there are, I know at least five kids who were named after my uh, brother in, in my refugee camp, people who knew my, my brother. Um, okay. So again, in 2014, my uh, childhood friend Ayman Shukur was killed by an Israeli ship while standing on the roof of, their, of his family's house. And it was a random shell, so the Israeli army was shelling the, his area randomly, killing him. And uh, this is his story. He was a bright young man, a graduate of Arabic literature who liked poetry. He was a painter, and he was the goalkeeper of our UNRWA um, 
uh, school when we were uh, little kids, so we grew up together. So this is his uh, stories. I think it's important to tell personal stories because we are not numbers. You know, stories do matter. And as part of you know this approach of telling personal stories, uh, I got involved in uh, translating a book collection of uh, interviews with the uh, young Palestinians, uh, Palestinian children from the West Bank who were arrested by Israel. Uh, the issue of child prisoners is one uh, important aspect of military incubation. One of the co consequences of military incubation in the West Bank, the book is called Dreaming of Freedom, Palestinian Child Prisoners Speak. And now, and speaking of child prisoners, uh, there are almost 700 Palestinian children arrested by Israel every year. Um, these children are uh, subjected to torture, uh, as UNICEF described it, it's, uh, you know, the uh, early treatment remains widespread, systematic, and institutionalized throughout the process of detaining Palestinian uh, children. Um, again, if we talk about child prisoners, Israel focuses on Jerusalem in particular, and they target Palestinian children in, in Jerusalem in particular, in order to create uh, a submissive uh, generation, especially in, in Jerusalem, and to make ha life hard for Palestinians by, the, you know, arresting their uh, children, demolishing their houses, etc. So these children are taken in the middle of the night very often. So Israel and the Israeli government uh, is able to send summons to these children, to their families, and they would bring them the next day. But they choose to uh, break into their houses in the middle of the night to terrify the children, turn the house upside down, destroy the furniture, and sometimes steal money and gold, and then take the children. Um, uh, they, you know, these children are interrogated, uh, tortured, uh, again, very often without the presence of their uh, lawyers and uh, parents. And finally, they are forced to sign confessions in Hebrew, a language they do not understand. This is a photo of a Palestinian child being arrested by a group of Israeli soldiers. So the book was dedicated to this child, Ayman Abbasi from Jerusalem. He was 16. And uh, a year before, he was arrested by the, the Israeli army. And uh, upon his release, while participating in a peaceful demonstration in Jerusalem against Israeli restrictions uh, against Palestinians in the city, he was shot dead. So. First, he was arrested, and then upon his release, he was placed under, under house arrest, where families become the jailers of their children. And Israel does this on purpose because instead of you know bringing these children to Israeli detention centers, which is the case under military occupation, where Palestinians are the oppressed people uh, face their jail, Israeli jailers, the oppressors. This is the normal equation. Families become the jail jailers because families want to make sure that uh, you know their children stick to their terms of their release. Otherwise, they will be fined. They will you know be forced to to pay very high fines, or their children might be arrested again. So house arrest is a way to destroy the fabric of the Palestinian society, turning families into jailers. Uh, and again. He was released uh, from this house arrest and he was killed. And not only this, the Israeli army tried to kidnap his body because they have a policy of uh, withholding the bodies of Palestinians. They should did in order to use uh, you know, these bodies in any future prisoner's swap deal. Uh, and they keep these bodies in what they call numbers graveyards where each uh, grave is given a number and th there is no name. So you cannot tell w which grave is which. But again, they have secret records uh, that contain the details of uh, these graves. And uh, in some cases, these you know, records were uh, lost. In other cases, because of rain, uh, the bodies washed uh, out. So, and again, uh, people made sure that his body is not kidnapped, because this means that he will be held, God knows, like 15 years, like my neighbor was in these uh, numbers graveyards. And uh, they smuggled his body, running from one street to another, and they finally managed to get him to the graveyard and to, to uh, lead him to, to rest. But this means that his family was not able to see him. Uh, and again, this happened after his story was, you know, after he was interviewed for the book. And this shows the importance of documenting these stories. Otherwise, his story would have gone 
uh, unreported and undocumented. Uh, that's why the, the book is dedicated to his life, because he was interviewed for the book, but uh, did not live long enough to see it published. Uh, so this is his story, and he sp speaks of how his family couldn't recognize him uh, at, uh, at court because of torture. He says, I was uh, shocked at the force the Israeli security apparatus used on me at my family's home in Jerusalem, Ras al Amud neighborhood. The moment I was arrested, I expected to be beaten. However, at the interrogation center, I was hit so badly in the face that when my family saw me at court, they could, not, could barely recognize me because of the marks and process. And again, uh, this is another example, uh, Malak al-Khatib, she's from Ramallah, and uh, while she was going back home from school, on a spring day, she wanted to pick up some flowers she liked, and she ended up in what Israel describes as a restricted <coughs> military zone. And again, she was arrested, and she was accused of entering and accessing a restricted area, and she was thrown in, in jail for uh, four months. So this is her photo when she was released. But again, if you look at her photo when she got into jail, it's completely different. So this experience changes these children for forever. I was, yeah, she was in jail actually, sorry, for two months. She says, I spent about two months with them. I was released and my heart was still full of sorrow, not because I was arrested, but rather because of the injustice Palestinians are still facing. And again, she talks about um, other female prisoners that she left uh, behind. Um, I will, yeah, stop here and... Uh First notice of a rally in West Haven, Connecticut on February the 21st for the family of a young man shot seven times by a Connecticut state trooper. 4.30 p.m. on that Friday the 21st. Now just a bit of the rally in Hartford against the proposed killingly fracked gas power plant. Be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. And some of the protests in New York City against the Hindu supremacy laws being enacted in India. I'm here because as a Hindu, I refuse to stand by while the Muslim population of India is rendered stateless in the name of my religion. More on both these issues next week. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.